Hi, everyone. I'm Stacey Klein. I'm the founder and artistic director of Double Edge Theater. We welcome you today. Thank you for your patience with the COVID safe distancing seating. Um, we appreciate that the back part of the room uses that door, and the front part of the room uses the store in case you need to go out for an event. Um, I have the honor to introduce the second in the Living Presence of Our History series presented by Double Edge with our partners Okiteo, an indigenous cultural center located autonomously at Double Edge. The Okiteo Council's co-directors Rhonda Anderson and Lyra's Bobby Crow Man's mission is to develop and create their own much needed multicultural and multi-tribal cultural space. However, they have also generously decided to share beyond their own people this educational series so that our communities can learn about the long unacknowledged history of the Nipmuc Nation and other tribal presence among us. The first in the Living Presence series delved into the reality of these tribes today their presence and the relationship to their millennia long history of presence in this region. What became clear as Larry and Rhonda shared stories of their upbringing and also their children's upbringing was how essential it is for allies of the indigenous community to give voice and space to the extreme challenges facing their community toward living a just and fully acknowledged, fully realized cultural life. This second in the series is subtitled Mascot, Logos, Imagery, and Cultural Appropriation. These are things that take away from a fully realized cultural life. The genocide and resettlement may appear to many as things of the past. But it must become known to us all that a history of colonial and forced disappearance of an entire people has a clear and horrifying imprint in today's world, including racist stereotyping in state seals, flags, school mascots, and other misleading imagery that only hold a false supremacist mirror to Native youth and to all those who are subjected to it into an image not of their own making, an image that is thrust upon them. This extends to the erasure in history and presence of a people whose way of life allowed our planet to thrive for millennia. And I don't think it's doing that well today, so I think we could all learn from that history. For this reason, Double Edge is devoting space and time to an autonomous place in which native voices and life are determinant and the final word on their own identity. So I want to, as, as my last words um, today, um, introduce the co-directors of Okiteo. Um, Rhonda Anderson, who will be the moderator of the event today is Inupiaq Adabaskan from Alaska. Her native enrollment village is Kaktovik. Her life work most importantly is as a mother, a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. She works as an educator, activist on the removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife refuge from extractive industry. Rhonda curated vital, vibrant, visible indigenous identity through portraiture, an ongoing collection and exhibit of portraits of native peoples of New England to bring awareness to contemporary indigenous identity. Rhonda is commissioner to Indian Affairs in Western Mass, a founding member and co-director of the Ogiteo Cultural Council and the Native Youth Empowerment Foundation, as well as a representative of the Native Movement. Thank you. 
Acknowledgement is always good. <laughs> Larry Spotted Crow Man is a citizen of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts. He is a nationally acclaimed, award winning writer, poet, and cultural educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker involving youth, sobriety, cultural, and environmental awareness. Larry's books, including Morning Becomes Thanksgiving and the Whisper Whispering Basket, are available online at both Double Edge and Ocuteo's websites. He has been a board member of the Nipmuc Cultural Preservation Development Review Committee at the Native American Poets Project and travels throughout the United States, Canada, and parts of Europe to schools, colleges, powwows, and other organizations sharing the music, cultural, and historic life of Nipmuc people and lectures on Native American sovereignty and identity. Larry is co-director of the Okiteo Cultural Council and the Native Youth Empowerment Foundation. And Larry will um, introduce the event today um, as we speak, and I'm only introducing Okiteo's co-directors because Rhonda will take over from there with everybody, all the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you all for being here. I thank the panel. First and foremost, it's important to, uh, to speak in my Algonquin language. So we say in our language, and I would ask you to please join me in this prayer, as we call it. Uh, please stand if you could. Sabani, which is supposed to. The sucker tiga huana, not as ni one menantion, king nuta yu cantaminok, and a male ni one quantum kicha, ka mata on anta, ka nagoti e cocuta minua, manatu, the sucker tiga huana, woman at the deal, ka no sucamusu amoke, minaho, and cantu chokest, yayo. I greet you in the words of my ancestors, I greet you in the words of asking our relatives to come and share this moment with us, that all of life would understand that reciprocity and that we would exchange today in a good way. And I ask that the blessings of our ancestors and all the living beings around us, above, below, and all around that would share in this moment, this now with us, that we would uh, enter into this space in a good way and share with one another. Shabbat. I'm gonna share a Nipmuc healing song. And um, the way it was taught to me by my uh, grandfather is that the, the, everything that we're doing, it starts right here with the heartbeat. And as we always talk about today and all this different term, turmoil, we forget that every living thing has this heartbeat right here. And instead of looking at the exterior, we need to start looking inside at that heartbeat and realize that we all start with this.
today and I just want to make sure I acknowledge that uh, this is the land of my ancestors, Akamtuk, Nipmung people, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, I speak in, as uh, Stacy uh, mentioned, I spoke in many parts of the world and, and it's always nothing like being able to share on the land of my ancestors. So it's really good to be here with you all today and uh, we have some very um, important things to discuss. So I look forward to the conversation. And at this time, I want to turn it over to my co-director, Ron Anderson. Thank you. Kalagisi, Rubulotak, Kaktovet Mio Goranga, Fairbanks me, Ami and I and Nuranga, Panga Paka no and Nuranga call Rainami, Anukak Shinaga Alak, Tanak Shinaga Rhonda Anderson, Shabakuna, Western Massachusetts Commissioner on Indian Affairs me, Koyanak Nalak Negavin, Ashfield Mute. So thank you very much and welcome. I am Anupak Athabaskan from Alaska. I was born in Fairbanks. Um, my enrollment village is Koktovik on the Beaufort Sea. Um, it's a very small village, um, but I grew up in Plainfield, uh, which is right next door. And I went to school at the beloved old Sanderson Academy here in Ashfield. And I choose to live here and call Western Massachusetts my home. Um, Coleraine is my home. And the land that I'm privileged to steward and live on is on the Pacamagon River watershed, which is also known as the Green River. And it's traditional Sokoki, Abenaki, and Pacamtuk traditional homelands. So I am very honored to be here today. Hoya Nakpak to Stacy Klein and Carlos Yeriona for giving, at Double H, for giving us this space and the platform for Indigenous voices to be centered. I'm going to go through um, a very long but traditional um, acknowledgement of this land that we're standing on, this land that we're all benefiting from at this moment in time, was and still is Wabanaki territory, land that was lovingly inhabited by Sokoki Abenaki, Pakumtuk, Nanatuk, Norwadic, Mohican, and Nipmuc people. Wabanaki means the place where the sun is born every day, making the people of this place people of the dawn land. Sokoki means people who go their own way, and they are still here in Southern Vermont. Mohican translates to people of the waters that are never still. And the Mohican, while they were pushed west with the Stockbridge and Muncie bands in the late 1700s to early 1800s, they were pushed onto Wisconsin Menominee tribal lands where they have a reservation today. They also maintain tribal land on the Hudson River near Troy, New York, where they come regularly to Massachusetts to maintain cultural ties to their historic homelands. Nonatuck means the middle of the river in reference to the Oxbow area of the Quinnatuckwa River. Nipmuc means people of the fresh water, as we just heard. And as well, they are still here in Massachusetts with a small reservation of land that has never been ceded. Pakumtuck is a word that would translate roughly to people of a swift, clear fishing stream. They were absorbed into the neighboring communities and we are actually in the watershed of the Pakumtuck River or the Deerfield River. We are also in the larger watershed of the Quinnatuckwa River or Connecticut River. Quinnatuckwa translates to the long river roughly in Abenaki. And while this river has known many names by many different groups of people living along its flowing path, Quinnatuckwa has stuck. It's important to remember that this area has been an integral place for indigenous people to reside, gather, hunt, fish and farm for millennia. Please get to know the indigenous people of your area and ask what you can do to lift their voices and honor and respect their sovereignty. So in that spirit, I have three action items. First, recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples of this area. Problematic terms like Pioneer Valley are a reminder of that legacy of dispossession, removal and subsequent erasure. Connecticut River Valley works just fine. 
Second, there are three bills that the tribes of Massachusetts support in the state house right now that address banning mascots from high schools, the state flag and seal, and to protect Native American heritage. The tribes that support this legislation are the Chappaquiddick tribe of Wampanoag Nation, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe, Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog, and the Nipmuc Nations. We need your voice, support, and solidarity for them to pass. Please contact your local legislator through maindigenousagenda.org and encourage them to support these bills. Third, this coming Wednesday, September 16th, is virtual lobby day. Um, change this, the flag and seal and ban native mascots from 10 to 12.30 a.m., well, 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in conjunction with the United American Indians of New England, North American Indian Center of Boston, Mascot Steering Committee, and Massachusetts Peace Action. Please check out masspeaceaction.org or email info at masspeaceaction.org. Thank you for listening. So officially, Pagalagitsi. Welcome to part two of the Living Presence series, a community conversation about mascots, imagery, and cultural appropriation. I wanna thank you. Thank you very much for coming here and listening today to this incredible panel of nine. This panel is consisting of indigenous community members, leaders, and scholars who will discuss issues associated with native mascots, cultural appropriation, and hear their experiences. So please let me introduce the panelists in today's conversation. We are truly honored and grateful for each and every amazing individual for taking the time out of their day to share with us. So of course, Larry Spada Croman, who you've already been introduced to, can you please tell me in two minutes, I'm gonna ask these like short questions as I'm introducing, tell me in two minutes or less, how you feel when you see a native mascot? First terms, I would just like to say, uh, thank you, Veranda. Uh, visual terrorism uh, is the first thing I think about when I see a mascot. Um, you know, and, and I shared this story many times in articles as well as growing up here in Ma uh, Massachusetts, uh, Springfield, Western Mass area, um, not having any sense of who I was because the, the school books uh, and everything I was learning was outside of a, a, an indigenous narrative. Um, everything I learned was, uh, essentially saying that people uh, of native ancestry had no contribution and that we were somehow like just these hapless bystanders benefiting from white proximity because uh, nothing was taught about how great we were or anything that we uh, accomplished. So, so as a kid, and, and uh, you know, I don't wanna go too long, but people think about, well, nobody complained about mascots before, but you need to understand that was, and this was in the eighties I'm talking about. And if we go back a little further, which we're gonna get into, you're gonna see how it was more uh, devastating. But just growing up in the eighties, this was like, you don't matter. That was the message that people uh, of, of indigenous identity was receiving. So to, to think about a mascot, then it was like, this is just the way it is. This is, that's me on that football helmet. That's me, the clown over there. That's me, the menstrual show. And so later on, as I grew up and as I became more self-aware of my identity, I, you know, I realized that this was, this mascot is part and parcel of that problem. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, we'll get into it later. Um, and my kids experienced the same, uh, the same phenomenon uh, early on when they were young and we had to deal with that. Um, so again, uh, just going back, if I could sum it up in two words, is visual terrorism. Thank you. Anthony Melting Tallow, botanist, fine chief, is an amazing visual artist, public speaker, and an indigenous social advocate. Anthony is an enrolled member of the Blackfoot Nation of Siksika, Alberta, Canada, and has been a resident of Chicopee Massachusetts since 2005. Anthony works to envision a sensitive interpretation of indigenous social discourse, aspirations for indigenous healing and in our movement towards truth, cultural pride, rebirth and resurgence. So two minutes or less, is the removal of mascots a part of native social justice and healing? It is, it is for me. Thank you for coming here and being part of this conversation. In my own personal experience growing up um, in Western Canada, um, it is part of our resurgence. It is part of reclaiming our identity. It is part of us telling our own stories, which are powerful, because a lot of our stories um, 
are tied up in the representation that we see growing up on a wider cultural um, social background. Uh, we grew up having no positive representations of ourselves as children. Um, what we learned in school was the bare minimum. Um, so there was no chance for us growing up as children, indigenous children. We grew up as so-called urban Indians um, um, from uh, Mokinsis, which is uh, Treaty 7 uh, Black Foot Territory in, in Western Canada. And uh, the city of Calgary resides on our traditional territory of Mokinsis. And in that context, um, we grew up in a very Western themed environment. Uh, the, the biggest cultural attraction in Calgary that exists today is the Calgary Stampede. And they had an Indian village there and we were, it, it was like we were left in the past. And we, if you went to the Indian village, you were, it was quite a distance from the main stampede. So there was no representation of ourselves in, in culture and on news, on TV and in, in storybooks. And what we did see, and which was far more damaging were these representations of ourselves that were quite unlike the realities that we lived in and grew up experienced. So seeing a mascot, it, it's, it, is, it is harmful to young people when that's the only representation that you see of yourself. You, you see this reflection back and it's, it doesn't frame you in, in the most positive light. You grow up trying to find your, your place in the wider society and reconnect with your cultural roots. And that's hard to do when representations of, pos of positivity are lacking. Yeah. Anna Juan Whedon is an enrolled member of his mother's Mashpee Wampanoag tribal community located on Cape Cod. He currently works at the MPTN Cultural Resource Department as an Eastern Woodland song and dance instructor for his father's uh, Mashantucket tribal community located on their reservation in southeastern Connecticut. Growing up on the Narragansett Reservation in south coastal Rhode Island, Anawan was instructed on traditional dances and customs of New England natives throughout his entire life. As an adult traveling abroad and visiting many other tribes across the U.S., Anawan has developed a comprehensive understanding of the vast diversity among many native cultures and customs. Anna Wan looks forward to any opportunity to share with public audiences while engaging others in cultural preservation for future generations to better understanding. Anna Wan, two minutes or less. Can you tell us how you became involved in removing mascots? Kwe, Kwe Kwasan, and Katapdash, thank you. Um, how did I get involved? I became a parent, I guess. Um, I care. I became a victim at a very young age in schools. Um, I grew up in a predominantly Caucasian area of Charlestown, Rhode Island. Um, I grew up on a reservation in Rhode Island. However, the second you stepped off that land, people forgot that they were ever natives there. Um, very, this pre predates uh, casinos and that awareness that again, people visit Foxwoods, but still don't know that they're visiting a reservation. So, um, you know, uh, like I said, I was just personally attacked for my own identity. My mom still won't let me cut my hair. Um, it was something that my parents, uh, you know, reiterated how important that kind of stuff is to our identity and to have to defend your identity every day, um, to be attacked for defending your identity in front of your peers, to be uh, chastised and sent to the principal's office to get detention or to be written up and given suspension. And uh, fortunately, my parents did come in to assist me during those times. But um, whenever you ask the teachers for help, they were worse. Uh, they were worse than your peers sometimes. Uh, what are you doing in the boys' room? The girls' room is across the hall. I mean, simple things like that that I witnessed in growing up in public schools. Uh, to see mascots used by a culture that for our, cult, our tribe in, in Mashpee, uh, we welcome these people. So. It's biting the hand that feeds you. That feeds you. Um, it's literally arrogance that, uh, as a Native American uh, traveling into other tribal territories, I personally could never do that. 
on somebody else's land. Um, so again, I think it's uh, important that we educate people. Uh, we have a president in the White House who forgot that he was an immigrant and still is. Um, so it's very important that we start with education. And as a parent, you know, I just wanted to basically uh, prevent my kids from going through a lot of the stuff that I know I had to go through, and basically any of our children. Thank you, Anwan. Brittany Wally is the Nipmuc Tribal Anti-Mascot Representative. She currently finds herself joining local Native voices during panel sessions with schools in Massachusetts that are looking to remove dehumanizing Native mascots. Her father served as a Nipmuc powwow with her late uncle, creating a connection that has created a path for Ms. Wally to examine what it means to be Nipmuc in a modern society and find meaningful ways to help serve her community. Ms. Wally runs B7, a traditional and contemporary indigenous art store with a focus on woven goods of native Eastern woodland cultures. Her work has been featured at the Concord Museum as well as Plymouth and Patuxet where she is a living history educator and native public programs assistant. A martial arts instructor, Ms. Wally holds a bachelor's degree in sociology with minors in philosophy and business management from Rhode Island College. She aspires to pursue a graduate degree in order to become a stronger advocate for indigenous voices in the future. So Brittany, can you tell us how mascots have affected your life and family through the cultural appropriation of the Nipmuc mascot? So that's actually a very interesting question when it comes to the Nipmuc mascot, if you're speaking specifically on Nipmuc Regional High School. Um, the story wouldn't pertain to me, but speaking quickly, uh, my father was actually out. And when my father is out, he usually wears a hat that says, you know, like Native Pride, and it has a bunch of other things on it, like a Navy veteran, things like that, to kind of identify the different things he's achieved in his life. But he does have a pin on the back of the hat that says Nipmuc Pride. And so when he was out, um, a young maybe a teenage, young teenage boy actually came up to my father and asked him if he was a um, administrator or a teacher, I suppose, um, at Nipmuc High School, which was pretty, you know, telling when you hear arguments about how these mascots are supposed to help preserve Native culture and how they're supposed to represent Native people. And here my dad was an active Nipmuc Pow or medicine person just in the store. And this student, you know, in the town assumed he was a teacher at the high school and did not think of the Nipmuc people. He immediately just thought of the high school. So, you know, there's a lot of lack of education right there. And when my father first told me that story, you know, it, it hits, it really hits deep and it, it doesn't feel good. Um, when it comes to myself personally, um, you know, I'd have to go way back to when I was first bullied for being an Indigenous person. Um, a little boy, I was in elementary school, came up to me and demanded to know where my feather was if I was Indian. And this is grade school, so I can't imagine where, you know, this child got that kind of language, but it stuck with me my entire life. And I do live in a town that has at least one neighboring school with a native mascot. So I'm not sure where that child learned that from, but those are two personal anecdotes on me and my immediate family. Um, in a greater sense, you know, native mascots really are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all of the issues and all of these, um, racially charged issues. It's really just the tip of the iceberg for me. Thank you for sharing, Brittany. Jamie Morrison is a descendant of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. He's a graduate of Winchester High School and was involved in helping start the discussion on mascot issue in the late 90s in Winchester. That initiative did not succeed, but this summer, Winchester finally voted to remove the Sachem, or as they say, Sachem name and logo. Jamie worked at the North American Indian Center of Boston as youth director and the president of the board of directors. He has been the head, man, head men's basketball coach at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas, MCLA in Western Massachusetts and UMass Boston. Jamie is currently the director of Urban Scholars and assistant basketball coach at UMass Boston, as well as the University Liaison for Native Students. Jamie, in two minutes or less, can you tell us how you became involved in anti-mascot work? Sure. So I think it probably all started um, 
when I was a student at Winchester High School, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, they were the Sachems and, um, you know, I, I was adopted uh, and sort of, you know, raised by a Portuguese mom. So uh, my connection with my native family, my biological native family was sort of somewhat limited and, and I went to a predominantly white high school. Um, and basically, you know, even though, uh, at, you know, at that point, I really wasn't connected, uh, seeing the things that played out at the pep rallies, at the high school football games, at the, at the soccer games, and being an athlete, uh, it really sort of affected me and sort of planted the seed um, for kind of the later work. And, and I think at that point, to be really honest, I, I was pretty young and, and wasn't really ready to, to tackle that uh, issue uh, for probably a number of reasons. But as I got older and continued to work, um, you know, at Winchester and and got involved with the Indian Center, uh, I felt like it was it was time for me to sort of step up and, and have that conversation in Winchester. And as you mentioned, Rhonda, uh, that did not go very well. Um, but just kind of seeing the things that were going on, uh, and and in that area, to be honest, you know, it wasn't just Winchester. There were four or five different communities, uh, sort of in Middlesex County, that all had, whether it was Red Raiders. Um, or some warriors or some other sort of nickname. And, and so, you know, it was a real kind of systemic problem, especially specific to that area. And it was just something that I sort of got involved in, felt passionate about. Uh, and the deeper I got into it, and, and really to be honest, the more resistance I got from the communities, sort of the more entrenched that I, that I really got involved. And then uh, as I got older, it kind of, kind of, kind of snowballed from there. Uh, and then seeing my experiences at, at Haskell, um, and at Haskell, it was obviously a little bit different, but when you go on the road to South Dakota or to North Dakota and, and go into some hostile environments, you it's really pretty eye-opening as to, to what the people are like and, and how you're treated. Um, so I've kind of been doing this work sort of ever since that. And, and you know, it's been going on probably close to 20 years now. Thank you. Laurel Davis Delano is a professor of sociology at Springfield College. Davis Delano's research is focused on inequality and injustice associated with race, gender, and sexual orientation. Davis Delano was recently a member of a team which engaged in research for the Reclaiming Native Truth Project. Davis Delano's current research is focused on the degree to which non-Native people are exposed to representations of Native Americans and the context of these representations, as well as white perceptions of Native identity. So Laurel, two minutes or less, this is a, this is a good question. Can you tell us one surprising fact that you discovered in your work as a researcher on these topics? Wow. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember what the surprises have been. Um, most recently, I can tell you that um, a team of us studied um, uh, what uh, non-Native people are exposed to, and uh, we studied over 5,500 people, and we asked them to name various things to type out, um, and I can tell you that it's pretty amazing that only 15% could name a famous contemporary Native person. Um, and only 25% could name uh, a television show with a reoccurring native character. And those are actually pretty high figures because some people didn't answer the question at all and they probably didn't know um, answers. And then we analyze, so that's one fact. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, Malia and Dana grew up on an Indian grew up on Indian Island in the Penobscot Nation's reservation and is the daughter of former Penobscot Nation Chief Barry Dana, who served from 2000 to 2004. As ambassador, Malian is a representative of the Penobscot Nation and serves as a liaison for the nation at the local, state, and federal level, levels of government in order to protect the Penobscot Nation's sovereignty, culture, and natural resources and their general welfare. Prior to serving as ambassador, Ms. Dana served as an elected member of the Penobscot Nation Tribal Council, the Human Resources Director for the Penobscot Indian Nation Enterprises, 
the Penobscot Nation Cultural and Historic Preservation Department and a substitute teacher for the nation school. She's also a proud and loving mother of two daughters. Ambassador Dana's advocacy resulted in the state of Maine recently enacting a law to change the annual Columbus Day in October to Indigenous Peoples Day and prohibit, <laughs> yes, and prohibit public schools from using derogatory mascots. Her other passions are finding ways to strengthen and expand programs that help to preserve and teach the customs and traditions of Penobscot people. So Malian, uh, when did you first notice mascots or instances of cultural appropriation and how did that make you feel? Two minutes or less. Awesome. Hi, Rhonda. Great to see you. Great to be with everyone. Um, so for me, it probably goes back to when I was around six years old and I saw the movie uh, Walt Disney's Peter Pan. And they sing a song called What Makes the Red Man Red when Peter Pan and all the Lost Boys, um, you know, for some reason have an adventure at an Indian camp uh, in Never Never Land. And I remember uh, I had grown up with my, my culture, my language. Uh, my father taught me so much, both of my parents, my mother's Penobscot too. So seeing uh, this representation of what was supposed to be my people done in such a mocking and stereotypical and really demeaning way on the big screen, you know, they're throwing around the R word, the S word. Um, it's pretty jarring for, for a very young child. So I remember having an anxious response to that, but as a child that young, you don't know how to um, compartmentalize that really in your, in your brain. And then in high school, when I started seeing my peers at other schools using Indian mascots, I think a lot of those same anxieties and feelings and, and anger came flooding back uh, that I had kind of shoved away as a child. So when I first started seeing the Indian mascots in use, it really sparked something in me that I think had been planted uh, a long time before seeing uh, Walt Disney's Peter Pan and, and that song. And if anyone hasn't seen that, I, I don't recommend you go watch it, but uh, it is probably one of the most blatantly racist pieces of um, cartoon pop culture really aimed at children having to do with indigenous people. So uh, definitely as a child and into my teen years and even as an adult, uh, it, it's still jarring to look at even after all this time doing this work. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Melissa Ferretti was born in Plymouth County, the daughter of Bernard Marston Harding, Herring Pond Wampanoag, raised in Cedarville, South Plymouth by Verna M. Harding, Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribal Elder, descendant of Love Saunders, Melissa attended Plymouth Carver School System most of her life and graduated Pembroke Academy. Melissa is a Commonwealth of Massachusetts licensed real estate sale association, so associate with Jack Conway and Company and a notary public. She is the elected chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe located in Plymouth, Mass. She volunteers much of her time to better serve her tribal community. In her dedicated role as a chairwoman, she currently serves on several committees, lots of them, <laughs> let me tell you, and um, that are engaged in social justice and educational initiatives. So Melissa, two minutes or less, why did you become involved in anti-mascot work? Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, well, I, I guess it, it really started, I, I, I grew up in Plymouth, as you know, and we all know Plymouth is America's hometown. And although we did not have a mascot per se, um, I think we constantly had the Mayflower and the whole Pilgrim story sort of shoved in our face growing up our whole lives. So being a native child in the town of Plymouth was very confusing. And being in the school system, we were not taught uh, the real, the real story of our people. So I think for me, it really started there. And I just remember, uh, you know, seeing some of the mascots for uh, some of the other schools and feeling a great deal of embarrassment almost and sort of, um, I don't know, I guess that's the word, uh, especially particularly 
when I was subjected to going to go get my birth certificate and reading my color or race and being determined as red written there on type on my birth certificate. So I think uh, as being as being elected chairwoman, I started really taking a good look at, at some of these issues and, and looking at some of the other mascots and it just really and lighted a passion in me to, to get involved and speak out about it. Um, the truth is native people feel invisible and often dismissed and these mascots really do us no justice. Um, colonial myths and racist ideas, um, they're intended to deny the diversity of tribal nations and communities today. So I'm happy to be here to speak out and uh, I hope we can make a difference in educating the public on why these images are, um, are not good for us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Shana Newcomb is a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe with a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism and political science. After switching careers from television to news to education, Shauna found her true passion that is teaching sixth grade science and social studies at the Hanover Middle School in Hanover, Massachusetts. This past summer, Shauna collaborated with other native and non-native advocates to successfully retire her school district's mascot, the Indian. She is passionate about continuing to honor and educate others about her present and ancestral heritage. So Shauna, two minutes or less, welcome. What has been your personal reaction when seeing mascots? Hi, Rhonda, and thank you for having me. Um, I guess my initial reaction to seeing Native American mascots stems back to when I was in high school. Uh, my school's rival is the Braintree Wamps. And as a Wampanoag, uh, I, I just felt like that was rude on a very ignorant level. Like when I see native mascots, the first thing that comes to my mind is ignorance. And in this case, ignorance is not bliss. In this case, ignorance is harmful and people need to educate themselves. Uh, so when there was a match in high school against our rivals, my school would have banners all around the school saying, stomp the womps you know, like get ready to stomp the womps. And it made me, it made me feel like I couldn't share who I was because I am a womp. Uh, and, and it made me feel like shy and not want to really be myself or even identify as my Native American background. So that was my very first initial encounter with Native American mascots. And now that I'm older, I'm not shy about it anymore. And having voices with me really makes me wanna make a difference. So that's why I'm here today. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna to get to the questions. Hopefully we will have enough time. We have a big panel and I want to hear personal stories, point of views, like I really am hoping that there's some deep listening that's gonna to happen today and hopefully some, uh, a, a greater understanding and education. Um, so my first question is, in what ways are Native Americans portrayed in mainstream society? Um, and even other representations of Native Americans in US society like um, consumer product names, logos, movies, and is that a form of cultural appropriation or is that about non-native control? So um, Anthony, what would you say is representational uh, cultural appropriation? Um, you mentioned a very important phrase in that question and that's, it takes our own voices away from us and the people that are speaking for us don't necessarily include us in the context of being this relationship relationship that's always important to indigenous communities, no matter where indigenous people happen to come from, kinship is very important to us. And that was the foundation of a lot of, even the basis of these original agreements, so-called treaties in that in our traditional culture of the Blackfoot, 
when we first saw European Canadians, we called them little brother. And that was, it was a family term in, in we welcomed them in. And very shortly after we became wards of the government. So the relationship flipped, which meant that our voices ceased to be our own. They became something else that if we were spoken about, if we saw ourselves reflected anywhere, it was not, we didn't have any say in that. So it's taking away our sovereignty, our autonomy, our relationship to the greater society. And that's been very damaging. And our story is, like I said before, very important. And everyone's story is important to that wider story. But we are in the process of healing today. We're in the process of going back and reclaiming our languages, our, our traditions. And given the space to speak about that is important. And, but to exclude our, our, our lives, our voices, our stories, our experience from the wider narrative is, continues to be damaging. So not nothing about us without us. Thank you. That's, that's a very powerful statement. Um, Melissa, are Native Americans in Massachusetts visible through this kind of representation of mascots to mainstream society? Well, as I said, I, uh, the truth is Native people uh, feel invisible and often dismissed. And there are no mascots that do honor to our tribal identity. And um, I think promoting the notion that they somehow make us more visible or that they're harmless fun to reduce our indigenous people to characters or stereotyped images is just ridiculous. I think that's what I would say about that. They're very destructive and um, there's many studies that say so. So no, they do not make us more visible. Right, and, and Laurel, you were, you were just talking about your uh, research that you, you recently submitted a review. And this is about how Native Americans are viewed through mainstream society. Would you care to take one minute to, to expand on that just a little bit more? Uh, are you talking about the mascot review or the other study? The, the study that you just submitted about how uh, mainstream society perceives Native American. Okay, so that's a team of four of us, um, Jennifer, Jamie Folsom, um, and, uh, Virginia McLaurin, Ariane Easton and Stephanie Freiberg. And we had over uh, like about 3000 college students from 12 colleges and over 2000 um, other people that were not college students. And in general, um, what exists is um, an invisibility of contemporary living native people um, in all sorts of representational forms. Um, meanwhile, there's some portrayal of Native Americans, somebody else's study, I mean, Native Americans in the past, um, somebody else found that in, high, uh, in curriculums across the country, 87% um, of what's covered is prior to 1900. So it's not just history, but it's um, history prior to 1900. And most of that um, coverage is stereotypes. Um, and so it's misleading representations of native history that uh, homogenize natives. Most of what we found is still kind of the violent warrior, uh, violent chief stuff um, with a little bit of kind of the noble, um, the noble stereotype thrown in there, both of which are uh, misleading and contribute and were used historically to um, enact harmful policies against native people. So that's, um, so it's a kind of horrible representational situation of contemporary invisibility and historic stereotyping. Thank you. So um, Brittany, how do you feel um, about mascots and do they portray Native peoples, as a Native person, how do you feel about that? Is it an accurate portrayal? 
Not in the least bit. Um, these mascots, as Laurel was saying, they really just show either that natives could be violent or noble. It's a very simplified one dimensional stereotype that comes out of these mascots. Um, you know, native people are multifaceted people and modern people and we exist today. So the fact that these mascots really relegate us to the past, it really hurts representation for native people today. Um, and also, if you're speaking um, very literally on what you're looking at for the visuals and the logos, a lot of them are not even accurate uh, depictions of Native people in the area. So, for instance, you'll see a lot of the typical uh, profile view with a large feathered bonnet on a male what you'll see for a lot of Native mascots, which is not even the correct style of what a Native person who may be going to defend um, their community, that's not what they would even wear in that, in the history or today, it's just not accurate. So in all different ways, it's a very inaccurate depiction of Native people and it's just a huge disservice. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I kind of wanted to get your point of view, Anna Juan. Do you really think that, that this um, most native mascots are male oriented, male native oriented, the, the, the savage, the warrior, the fighting? Does this represent you? Um, no, there, there has been terminology. I just want to take that brief pause because uh, the term warrior. It does come up and I don't know, I personally, I do not take offense to being called a warrior, savage, red skin. Obviously there are uh, many names that come with such a head tone of racism and oppression that come with it. A warrior, uh, for example, the Nasa out on the Cape, uh, the Nasa school, the Nasa warriors, uh, they, that is where they were defending their territory quite efficiently. Um, they actually, forced the Mayflower to uh, sail to Plymouth because they were no longer welcome there. So, I mean, that, that's, a little, that's a little touch subject in that one area, that one community. And a lot of this has to do with, uh, again, how is the local community feeling represented? Um, are they represented? Uh, I do want to point out someone like the Seminole tribe who made a, a specific arrangement to use uh, their name and terminology and imagery, I believe. So uh, Braintree or Quincy Wampanoags, uh, I've heard of these folks, but jurisdictionally, we weren't even in that area. Uh, the imagery that I hear goes along with that, very derogatory. I just heard from a fellow tribal member how it made her feel. Uh, so no, in, in a nutshell, all of them are very degrading. I also want to end on just pointing out that why can't we promote more of the good, positive influences that have been in not just native culture, but American culture. Jim Thorpe, classic example. Uh, it's, it's horrific to hear that people cannot even come up with one name of one individual. Jim Thorpe is an Olympian. He played professional basketball and baseball. I mean, like this guy was a uh, football. He, he did it all. Um, we had one right here in New England, uh, Tarzan Brown, for those of you who are familiar. Uh, anybody in New England, I've been very proud to meet quite a few individuals who are aware of this man and his establishment, his accomplishments, but he too went to the Olympics. He too is a, a recognizable symbol uh, that I, I myself still look up to. I look up to many role models that unfortunately aren't considered, uh, I guess, noble or savage. Thank you, Anna Juan. So I want to start from the very beginning. I want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of mascots. So Laurel, in, in very brief terms, this is your field of study. Can you please um, educate us on when native mascots became fashionable? Sure, and I, I can be brief. So as I mentioned before, historically in the US, there were two stereotypes. Um, and they were used by whites to um, generate harmful policy. One was the, what scholars call the bloodthirsty savage and the other one was called the noble savage. The bloodthirsty savage was used to, you know, kill native people and shove them and restrict them to particular locations. 
and move them. And the other stereotype was used for assimilation and white control over native people and so forth. Um, so the, you know, the, the warrior stereotype that's currently um, still used in mascots, that was not something white people liked historically. I mean, that was in their minds, extremely negative. When the quote unquote, what's called Indian Wars ended in the late 1800s, that's when uh, after that, uh, some whites started to adopt um, the kind of warrior stereotype, native warrior stereotype um, for their teams. It really took off in the early 1900s. This was at the same time organized sport was um, rising up. Um, and there was a kind of crisis with white masculinity and they like latched on to both native mascots and particular animal mascots. And the animals that were selected were animals perceived as um, aggressive and violent. And so uh, here you have lots of native mascots being selected at the same time as um, animals that are perceived to be violent um, are also selected. And that's the main mix of mascots that rose up and that's the main mix of mascots we still have. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm also, I just wanted to also point out that at this time um, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, our children were being removed um, and, and put into boarding schools and culture taken away from our children as a policy of intentional cultural genocide. And at that same time, as Laurel had said, that is when um, the melting pot of America was trying to find a, a common identity. And so native mascots were being used. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. It's not a, a very savory topic, but it, it gives some clarity on why they're being used. Um, and if we're striving to do anti-racist work, we must undo the systemic and institutional racism that begins with all of our children in public schools, beginning at the early age of kindergarten with the myth of Thanksgiving and Columbus Day. The hurt and the harm of this kind of education is real and it is lasting. Furthering acceptable racism through the use of mascots in high school cements these learned biases and makes this type of cultural appropriation acceptable. What are some instances of biased stereotyping or racist behaviors have been experienced in high schools with mascots with you, Larry? Go, you shared an important experience with your son. Yes, yes, um, certainly. Um, just real quick, I wanted to touch on Laurel, just um, circle back a little bit to that. Um, and Ron, you pretty much set it up. And it's important for educators and people who are trying to find answers to uh, the problem with mascots, you know, just kind of rewinding back to the history, let's just first ask the question, what is a mascot? And a mascot essentially goes all the way back to medieval times when people were having talismans and it had to do with conjuring spells and, uh, uh, and a lot of mythology and so on. So that kind of transported into uh, having these lucky charms as it were, as a, as a good luck form of, of winning at a sport or, or so on. So. So eventually you end up having this group of human beings being your lucky charm. And that's where, uh, you know, indigenous bodies uh, begin, to, begin to take that place. And, um, and as Rhonda pointed out, during this time, it was the time of uh, the removals. This is uh, the time when uh, more states were added to the union about a hundred years ago, all the states were being added. Indians were being pushed out West. Uh, our children were being rounded up in boarding schools. Uh, uh, there was uh, no Indians allowed and dogs on signs uh, in my great grandparents' time. And so this is the time that uh, native mascots bore into. And, and at the same time, uh, Asian, Jewish American, and, and uh, Latino American, the, the most disparaging and reprehensible cartoons were being drawn up at the same time these mascots were. And, and I mentioned this many times, somehow the native mascot survived, but, but all these other images are, you know, ha have not because we recognize them as, as, as uh, abhorrent. Um, and one of the things I, I realized in that, when I think about why people still accept native mascots and, and it's, I see that sort of a coping mechanism, not wanting to, in a denial in a sense of not wanting to recognize that we've been causing this harm for so long. And uh, that's why it's important to have these conversations, look at the genesis of that. And uh, getting to the point where Rhonda talked about growing up uh, in my town, uh, about 
12 years ago now, we had to remove a, a very disparaging mascot as well. And uh, the superintendent and principals and the staff of school were very uh, welcoming that we went on to this endeavor because once they kind of took a look at it and, um, and we had these uh, talks uh, in front of the school, they realized how horrible this idea was, this nitpunk mascot. It was this creature, like looked like a half bird, half human. And the, the nose was just, uh, it was just really horrible looking. That's, I didn't want to even bring the image here to show it because it's just, nobody needs to see that. It was terrible. And uh, these are the kind of things that I'm supposed to look at in my children to represent who we are. Um, so when my son was, uh, he was about 11 years old, we played football on the, on the, the Pop Warner team. And uh, as I said, many, as, as Brittany talked about, in our Nipmunk community, we have many native mascots and Nipmunk this and Nipmunk that. So in our town, of course, there was a, a Nipmunk mascot and Nipmunk uh, uh, team. And uh, while my son's out there playing football, somebody, uh, a few people in the crowd started, woo, 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 during that thing. And, um, and uh, it, it was, uh, and my son, you know, and, and, and his teammates as well, they all were looking up and, and this lady was just going at it. She was going at it. And my cousin, who's not here, uh, he passed on tall pine, went over to her and talked to her. He said, you know, there's, a, there's Native American children out there playing and uh, this is highly offensive. And, and, the, and, the, and the lady, she says, oh, I didn't know. I didn't realize how, and so there's really a lot of ignorance around th these kind of things. And shortly after my, uh, my son, uh, he was so embarrassed, he quit the team. And he's probably mad I'm even talking about it now, but uh, it's important to remember these, uh, these incidents because uh, uh, I've spent my life work 30 years now uh, working at this since I was 21 years of, of age to, to prevent these kind of things to, that they wouldn't happen to my children. And, uh, uh, and, and they're still happening. And, and, it's, so, and, it's, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, and as some of the younger uh, indigenous people on the panel are, st are still experiencing that. And so we're really trying to make changes that, and we certainly appreciate the efforts of educators and, and, and allies and accomplices who are really out there working with us to make this change and starting to see the deleterious effects that it's having on uh, individuals' lives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's see, Jamie, you must see this when you're on the road at games at different schools with mascots. <laughs> and uh, as a second part to that question, like what do you see at schools with mascots? Would you move to an area with a mascot so your children went to that school? Right. So, um, yeah, as a as a former athlete, and then and then having coached, um, you know, a at Haskell, but now back in Massachusetts for the last almost fifteen years. Um, when you go on the road, whether it's recruiting, especially around state tournament time. Um, you know, not a lot has changed in, in some aspects uh, since I was a, a player in the 90s and things like that. Um, you look into the crowd and, and you see mostly, you know, uh, Caucasian uh, fans and, and they have what they perceive, I think, as as war paint. Um, invariably, at some point during the game, the tomahawk chop is going to break out, especially during a state tournament game. Um, you know, and, and so... And, and often, as Larry just mentioned, you know, people don't realize that there are native athletes out there and, and how harmful that can be. Uh, and, and that's and that's often the case, you know, when it's when a school says, oh, well, we're being very respectful uh, or we're trying to honor, which, which we know is is not true. But the other side of the coin is when you when you play another town and you go on the road, you can't control uh, how they're going to embrace that. And so, um, you, you know, you sort of get it from from both sides. Uh, but whether it's the chop, you know, whether it's war whoops, whether it's face paint, whether it's people running up and down the side of the field, banging their drum, you know, all these things uh, are really pr pretty damaging. Um, you know, often when we leave games at Haskell, uh, you know, our kids would be infuriated, uh, not only with the way we were treated by the officials because we were native uh, in the crowd, but it was upsetting. It, it was really hard to process how to really feel. Do you feel sad? Do you feel mad? Um, the, the good thing is we had each other. So it was sort of kind of, kind of, uh, I think, uh, Molian mentioned it earlier, kind of being together made it a little bit easier to process, but, um, you know, it doesn't take away from, from those memories and things like that. I think, and, and you mentioned, I have two sons, they're both athletes. Um, and when I moved back to Eastern Mass, I grew up in Eastern Mass, but as you mentioned, I, I coached out in Western Mass for a number of years. Uh, and when I moved back, uh, I immediately took every town off, every community off that had a native mascot. Uh, I, I didn't want my students, my kids to go through that, um, you know, as, as native, native folks and, and native athletes. And so automatically right away, I was like, we're not, we're not gonna do that. Um, 
And so we looked for towns and communities that, that were diverse and hopefully welcoming and that you know did not have native mascots. Um, that was sort of an automatic. So yeah, even in, in 2020, right? 30 years later, you're, it's, it's the same conversations like Larry said. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I went through the same thing. My own daughter, um, she does not go to the local high school here as they are the Mohawk Warriors. And I did not want her to go through that. Um, same experience that I went through. I went, I went to Mohawk Trail Regional High School as well. And I um, did not want my daughter to have that same experience at all. So she goes to a, another school without that mascot. Um, Brittany, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I do. Um, in my youth, when I was in high school, I was not a high school athlete. I actually did my sport of martial arts outside of any kind of school organization. So learning about athletics and how they interact with the schools and how they function is a bit new for me. However, looking at native mascots and looking at athletic philosophies, I have found one really interesting reoccurring thing that I would just like to bring to light if we're speaking on what you see in sports today. So although I may not be a coach or a high school athlete, I would just like to bring it up. Um, and you can go online and find um, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association's taunting policy, which I find very interesting uh, to bring up. And if I could just read a little bit of it um, quickly, it states that taunting includes any actions, comments by coaches, players, or spectators, which are intended to bait anger, embarrass, ridicule, or demean others, whether or not the deeds or words are vulgar or racist. Included is conduct that berates, needles, intimidates, or threatens based on race, gender, ethnic origin, or background, and conduct that attacks religious beliefs, size, economic status, speech, family, special needs, or personal matters. And then it goes on and on to list all of the punitive things that they will do to discipline any athletes, any, any spectators, they might even be ejected from the game, athletes might not be able to play, um, how they address coaches. And I find that really, really interesting because these schools are putting this quote into their athletic handbook. So they know what taunting is. They know that it's inappropriate to taunt someone due to their culture, due to their ethnicity. And yet these mascots are an immediate way to taunt native people of their ethnicity and of their culture and their background. I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you very much for bringing that up because it is, um, it, it is a double-edged sort of way of looking at it. It's, um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> while you're here, Brittany, um, I hear constantly that the intention of mascots is to honor Native people. Brittany, is this honoring Native people by using mascots such as Warrior Indian, Brownies, Red Raider, Womps, Nipmuc? I didn't quite hear the end of your sentence, nor do I think I need to, to understand the question. Um, no, no, this honor, it, it's not true honor. It's its just patronizing. Um, something that I often find myself saying is, you know, if you, if you really wanna honor native people, get involved, meet them, reach out to them, talk to them, because you, you cannot force honor on somebody like that. That's, that's no way that honor works. Um, it's just a flat no for me. Even the ones that are very straightforward, like the mascot that I brought up, the, you know, the Nipmuc mascot, even that didn't honor, doesn't honor me, didn't honor my father, doesn't honor my tribe in any way. You know, something to honor Native people would be to listen to them. You know, that's, pretty baseline. Um, listen to them. This is not something new that Native people have been bringing up. So listening, having empathy, maybe actually teaching the real history, um, maybe bringing in a Native representative or a Native um, anything, maybe an artist, a storyteller, a song. Like a lot of us do more than one thing and we're right here in the area. Getting people and genuinely interacting with them, that could be honor, but using our images as mascots to have who know what's happened at games and pep rallies, that's not honor. That's just something that people say to make themselves feel good. 
Yes, thank you. And so still acting as devil's advocate here, Shauna, is this, this, this is honoring and it's had a long history. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is this, is this honoring um, a long history? And is, and, and is you know, how, how does that sit with you? Uh, it's funny. Uh, it's funny because Native American mascots do, does not definitely bring honor to Native American people. Um, and to say that it comes from a tradition, right? So when I was trying to get my school district to retire their Indian mascot, the biggest, uh, the biggest, I guess, uh, fight against me was that, well, this was our tradition. And we've been the Hanover Indian since 1964. And many other schools can say the same. But in reality, Native American culture and its history began 15,000 years ago, um, right in the end of the Ice Age. And and so how can a history of 15,000 years compare to a school's history of having that as a mascot for 30, 40 years? That's not true history, that's not true tradition. And to see students with headdress logos on their hat, helmets and t-shirts, it's, it's making a mockery of us. It's a, at that point, it's a costume. And we know better as Americans to not on Halloween, right? We it's it, we can't even talk about it because I feel so uh, wrong it's even thinking about it. But we don't dress up as a different race. If we were to put blackface on, right? We know that's wrong. So why is it okay to put feathers in our hair and to put war paint on our face? It is the same thing. We know that we can't do things to our face to make us look like a different race. But when it comes to Native Americans, it seems like people forget that. And that's pathetic. Thank you. Um, we've all heard that the intention of mascots is to honor and the intention might be felt as a good thing. But what we honestly need to look at is intention versus the harm. And there is decades of empirical evidence and studies that show the outcomes and effects of mascots. So Laurel, very briefly, can you sum up what the empirical evidence is against mascots? What is the harm? Sure. So um, um, Joseph Gahn, um, Stephanie Freiberg and I recently published a summary of all the research on effects which we're making the point that educators need to look at the effects as they do with everything else in their school or that they should do. Um, and the findings of the studies that we reviewed are, uh, can be grouped in two ways. The first group is um, studies of effects on native people. And the findings on that are that exposure to native mascots lowers the self-esteem of native youth it reduces the capacity of Native youth to imagine achievement-related selves for themselves uh, for the future. Um, it reduces Native youth's belief that their Native communities can make a difference. It also, in um, um, other studies, increases negative feelings of um, Native younger people, um, like increases stress, um, increases depression, increases um, hostility. Um, and in one study, it caused some Native youth to avoid going to athletic events. Then there's a larger body of research that looks at the effect on non-Native people. Um, and first of all, one group of studies shows that um, for non-Native people, Native mascots are associated with negative thoughts um, and negative stereotypes of Native Americans. Um, the probably most important set of studies in this group shows that exposure to Native mascots increases um, negative stereotyping of Native Americans. Um, a couple studies also show that it increases um, discrimination or the tendency to discriminate. Um, uh, the exposure to Native mascots does that further. Um, those who are um, 
um, who favor native mascots are more apt to hold prejudice and negative stereotypical ideas than those who don't. Um, and although these findings are about negative effects on non-native people, which are like increasing prejudice and stereotyping and discrimination, which is not sound, obviously that indirectly then affects native people because if you've got all these non-native people with these biases, then that's gonna affect their treatment, um, how they vote and, and other things like that. So that's the findings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I guess I, I just wanted to, to, to really drive home that, that these, we have the highest rate of, of teen suicide. I mean, I'm not playing a, a Prussian Olympics, but these are the facts. We have the highest rate of teen suicide. We have the highest rate of uh, native men that are incarcerated or are killed through police brutality. We have the highest rate of murdered and missing indigenous women. We have the highest rate of sexual assault of any race on this continent. That is North, I mean, uh, of America and Canada. And a lot of this is through representation and how we are viewed and how we are treated. So I, I kind of want to, make this an open question, but I'll, I'll direct that to Anthony, like how your experiences and how you've been treated as a native person. Um, is that uh, through, do you feel that it may have been through the effect of biases? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, my own lived experience relative to growing up indigenous in a non-indigenous society, we were um, brought up in the city of Calgary and in the 1970s, the common term, the blanket term for any indigenous person who chose to live off reservation was urban Indian. And the effects of what we saw as children growing up were all negative. They were either drunk, panhandling, living on skid row, welfare bums. We didn't have any positive role models. Um, we lived at the effect of all of these this institutionalized racism. Um, in terms of uh, the context of my own experience, and Rhonda mentioned this before with the board, boarding schools in the United States, the last residential school in Canada closed in 1996 in Saskatchewan, well within the lifetimes of most people living today. And we were not allowed to leave our reservation to find work, to sell uh, products of our own, um, do um, agriculture production on the prairies. We were forced in farming um, after the loss of the buffalo. We weren't allowed, allowed to leave our reservation until 1958. Um, if we did, we were, there was a pass system, which was illegal. It was a violation of our human rights and they knew it. So what they did was they buried that documentation. There was this lack of, of relationship that we as indigenous people always held as important because we felt that we upheld our traditional agreements with the treaty system and we didn't see the benefits at all in terms of how we were received, how we were treated. We were, um, as a result of not seeing any positive reflection of ourselves growing up, we lived at the direct effect of that. Um, I lost two brothers um, to alcoholism, they, were, you know, they died on the streets of Vancouver and Calgary. Um, I just recently lost a nephew who died in the same way as my younger brother uh, a few months ago. And there was no notice, no investigation, no autopsy as to the reasons behind their, their passing. They were just, other, just another dead Indian. And so when we get to the point where we don't see ourselves, where we don't see our own stories, we're the under undertold story. And the fact that we're speaking up about this representation now is because we haven't been allowed into, our voices haven't been heard in the wider context of American or Canadian society. And the fact that we've gotten here in our own healing journeys is it's, it's testament to you know, our own struggles and what we try to do to educate and 
keep those kinship bonds going because um, my grandfather said that we have to live together. And this is a good way to, to do that by having these conversations and these forums. And I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I often hear that removing mascots will eradicate indigenous people. Um, Malian, will we disappear? Did the Penobscot people in fact disappear after their mascot removal? I hope not, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> um, no, and, and I think that it's so interesting because up in Maine, there are five reservation communities. Um, and growing up, you'd be surprised how many times I heard that people didn't realize there were any indigenous people in Maine. Maine is 98% white, I think. So um, talk about invisible. You know, the, the only portrayal of us in Maine society was these high school mascots. And it wasn't us doing the portraying, it was these non-native students dressing up in the headdresses and the war paint and the feathers. So if anything, I've seen that when we remove those, um, it has sparked all these discussions about, you know, well, why were they asking for that? Uh, you know, what, what did they think and feel? How are their lives? You know, th there's definitely the, the group of just outright racists don't take our identity and these mascots away. Um, but I have seen this growing amount of people that genuinely did not know there were tribes here. Uh, they relied on these mascots for their knowledge of native people. And, and it has uncovered for them this whole new world of, well, let's learn about the tribes. Um, why are these mascots wrong? Uh, you know, why are they feeling that way? So if anything, it's been really positive uh, for people spreading you know, awareness and compassion and humanity. And a lot of these, you know, we talked in the previous question about the racism we face dealing with these battles. And I think the, the violence against activists speaking out on these things is just immense. And it's something that I've struggled with. I, I know that a lot of people have, you know, I was getting rape threats, death threats. People were threatening my children. And it's like, over what? <laughs> Your high school mascot? You know, these are like people in their 40s and 50s so attached to their glory days, um, you know, that, that, that they get this angry and violent, but it's so much deeper than that. Uh, it's really thinking about what do I merit, do, what do Americans identify as when you don't have cultural roots, when you don't have family traditions and stories, uh, when you feel disconnected, it's no wonder they grab onto that and they, and they want to be that. And when you confront them about it and say, well, actually, that's my culture. That's my uh, family. That, that's my religion you're mocking. It, it can be a very uh, controversial, difficult process to get through. But I think in Maine, we're working through it very well. And the change had to come in the form of a law because people can't argue with that. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the, how it's a fact. You know, today in this conversation, it's so great to hear, you know, we just accept these things now. When I was coming up as a teenager, a lot of things were still blurry and people didn't accept that mascots were wrong, Indian mascots. So it's so refreshing to hear, these are the cold hard facts, this is the research, this is the numbers and the data, uh, because that arms us making these policy changes and decisions and that leads into behavior and attitude changing. And it sure does take a while, but, but it really is worth it. Thank you. Um, so with that question, you know, how should communities with mascots and logos move forward? And I know that that answer to that question regarding mascots will become apparent after creating lasting and reciprocal relationships with area tribes within the educational communities and communities at large even with these mascots. Um, is that a beneficial approach, creating reciprocal relationships with tribes? Anna Juan? Uh, beneficial to whom, I guess? Um, I'm sure there's, uh, I personally try to find silver linings in every cloud. So um, 
some people's sea cups half full and half empty. Having said all of that, um, it's a necessary step. Um, you can't make rules and laws and even just do away with imagery and names, terminology and whatnot. If you're not educating as to why, you're not educating as to the it's it's a hidden battle that unfortunately we've just we've heard a lot of testimony this evening, personal testimony from people and how this has affected just about every single one of our individual lives, uh, where our kids can and cannot go to school. Um our loved ones and their self-esteem and their struggles and all of this. Um, so it's an important part that you don't just wash it under the rug, wipe it away. Not that, again, we're going to disappear. The problem's going to disappear. The arrogance and ignorance will disappear. Um, we're not really, we're barely scraping the surface we don't educate people. So uh, whenever I do education, I always encourage the parents to attend with the children. A lot of these children are being taught things in schools now that their parents were not exposed to. Um, when they get home with that information, the child then has to defend what they just gained in a, in a school setting. Uh, and of course, sometimes if you're in the wrong household, the parent's always right. Um, so unfortunately, like I said, uh, we as advocates uh, within our own communities, um, I just personally want to just take a little bit of time and just thank uh, my brother Anthony Tony there uh, for what he shared. Um, it's a tragic tale that all of our communities go through the lost loved ones again the inner struggles the battles with self-esteem that a lot of us we don't know until it's too late and they're gone um to hear that there are no role models in these communities that these people can look up to and emulate that's what we that's where we have to step up so if i could just like push the conversation from what the non-native communities need to do for themselves I want to speak to all of us in this native community uh, that we need to step up ourselves. Uh, we need to be there for our kids. We need to set those examples, not just at times like these with having these conversations, but in our everyday daily lives, how we interact with one another, how we interact with our children and, and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Anawan. Um, Larry, can you expand on that? Like, what would be beneficial about going into communities and schools with mascots and creating an educational program or a lasting reciprocal relationship? I think um, sharing the stories from the people as we're doing now, uh, these are shared and lived experiences of indigenous people of today who, have, uh, who are recipients of what we call generational trauma, the boarding school area, the removals, the, the missing and murdered indigenous woman, uh, the beatings from law enforcement, the discrimination, uh, the alcoholism, the, the depression, the, the health disparities across the board, the poverty. And so our communities were faced with these issues because of that. And so um, um, the mascot is all part and parcel of that. And just going back a little bit to um, um, what Malin was talking about and Tony, you know, um, when people get so angry about uh, they just you know this they get this indignation about them about that's my mascot and it's really about story right when we're talking about story so what story are we telling to, to ourselves and as a traditional storyteller I really uh, inherently receive that understanding so America was taught a story of exceptionalism we're exceptional people you know and uh, and this has been ingrained into an inculcation of you know this white exceptionalism of, of, of who we are and what we are and everything else comes secondary. And so, and at the same time, indigenous people were told the story that they don't matter. Um, um, and as, as, as I said, as a storyteller, uh, we are part of the land and the land is part of us. Everything that we share is a place that someone can actually go to, see the water, the river, the, the trees, the, the, the landscape, the cosmology, the way the sky sets is all part of that story. 
And that was taken away from indigenous people. So they have nothing to reflect back to. The skies became Greek, the water and land became English. And then we have no self identity anymore other than what we're told by other people. And so when you feel like you don't matter, you begin to behave like you don't matter. Hence you have uh, in 2014 to 2016, we had 24 suicides right here in Massachusetts. This is what we've experienced. So we're losing one child a month from a native community for two years straight. Uh, and this all goes back to that identity. How do we feel about ourselves? Um, and so these are the words that we need to get out to the people who are on these boards and are making decisions about native bodies in terms of a mascot, putting us on that helmet. That's not a real, uh, that's not a real form of ed education. That's not a real form of reciprocity and, and, or an opportunity for us to learn or share. And, and also I wanted to expand that uh, the non-native community is missing out a great deal too of the wealth and breadth of indigenous knowledge and epistemology that's out there, whether it's uh, agriculture, whether it's cosmology, science, uh, the history of this land of, you know, most people don't know, uh, there are more native people per race, race or racial identity that served in the military, Revolutionary War, Civil War, and so on. And so these are all facets that nobody knows about, nobody's talking about. And uh, these are the important things other than, you know, charging on a helmet that should be talked about. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's really important points. I'm kind of going to go back just a little bit. Um, Malian had a great uh, point. As a Native woman, myself, personally, speaking up for change, <laughs> I have faced harassment, online bullying, threats of harm, um, you name it, all kinds of, thankfully Anthony's usually by my side, so I feel safe. <laughs> um, but sometimes I'm the only Native person standing up in front of school committee meetings or in, in these community meetings. And I honestly don't feel safe. And it is a lot of time. Now the one silver lining to COVID is we're all here on Zoom, right? But most folks, they, they live two hours away or more. This is not a reality for our school committee meetings. So to have a turnout like this has been a real silver lining, like I said, to our COVID right at the moment. You can hear from multiple Native voices our true experiences. Um, so I guess, um, Malian, your experiences, can you please talk about the importance of making a statewide change rather than an individual school by school basis in the state? I know you did this in Maine. We're looking to do this in Massachusetts. Absolutely. I would highly recommend doing this at a state level. And uh, I, I come at that as we had already changed all of our schools, actually, by the time we had the law by like two months, we had changed the last school and then the law came into effect. But I still feel very, very strongly that we need the law in place. When I started my activism around this, we had probably 30 to 40 schools in Maine using these mascots and kind of one by one, they changed. Uh, a lot of them did it on their own. Some of them collaborated with native speakers and communities. I, I did a fair share of speaking at different schools throughout my life. And, and we saw a lot of great changes. Um, the high school directly next to our reservation was the Old Town Indians. And in 2005, they made the change. And it was such a huge weight lifted, um, you know, being able to send Penobscot students there without having to be an Old Town Indian. Um, so there was, there was a few schools that really held on and a couple of them are using the term warriors, but they had a lot of the imagery and the face painting and the feathers and stuff. So I think we get into a, to a nuanced area there. Uh, so they, they did vote to remove imagery, but keep the warrior's name in those two cases. And I agree with Anna Juan that, um, you know, a, a warrior is something I think a lot of us take pride in. And that's definitely more of a gray area, um, but kind of the, the approach we've taken in Maine is that removing that imagery is the most important thing and, and kind of um, keeping an eye on the behavior and stuff. So we had one community, the Skowhegan Indians um, up in central Northern Maine, and they held on to their mascot fiercely. Um, the Skowhegan comes from a Wabanaki word. So, you know, they, they really felt, you know, I tell this story a lot. They really felt so connected to it, but I had a gentleman who now serves on the school board, uh, walk up to me after a meeting, put his finger right in my face and said, I'm just as Indian as you are and Skowhegan is my tribe. <laughs> 
Uh, so it, it hit me right then, like, this is so much deeper than just a mascot. This, you know, these people have really, you know, they think they're a tribe. So we've done so much work, you know, they voted in 2015 to keep their mascot. And uh, we've done so much work in educating that community. And to the, to the credit of a lot of our allies in that area that just didn't give up and, and kept bringing us back and, and making us feel safe. You know, I, I was accompanied by the chief of police sometimes going to those meetings. So, so they really did do some work uh, to, to try to make the environment a little bit better for us. So we were able to get some people on the school board that wanted, really wanted to make this change and they felt embarrassed by the people in their community. Uh, but there was also this group called Skowhegan Indian Pride that is very dedicated to keeping this mascot. Right now they are trying to elect one of their leaders to our state house. Um, they are big President Trump supporters. They see this as, you know, we're all snowflakes and we want things politically correct. So there is this movement to try to bring these mascots back in some of these places in rural Maine. And now that we have the law on the books, um, that really slows that backwards movement down because we can point to this law and, um, you know, a, a law is a hard thing to undo. So it's definitely needed. Thank you. And, and you mentioned Skowhegan Indians. We had the same kind of situation here. As I mentioned before, um, Mohawk Trail Regional High School, the Mohawk Warriors, when you put those two together, it's really hard to unsee a native mascot. And the rebranding effort, uh, honestly, from my perspective, I feel like it's a waste of money and they have spent money on trying to rebrand themselves as something other than a native warrior, even being Mohawk Trail Regional High School. So, um, I, I know that recently, um, Brittany, you had worked on getting together a list of schools in Massachusetts. And at one time that was around 40 schools. Um, have you seen a trend in the last few weeks? In the last few weeks, I have seen a trend that is um, a little discouraging. So. In creating that list, it does touch on the nuances that people are speaking on right now where you may have minimal changes at a school or a rebranding, if you would say. So um, it's kind of tricky to really pinpoint exactly what you wanna look at, but for schools that are flagrantly offensive, um, there are two right now within the last week or so that have been defending their mascot, which is really discouraging. Um, earlier in, in August, we did have two more that you know, they, they got rid of their mascot, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, it's something that I believe we just kind of spoke on, but having some kind of law would really, I think, help because for me, you know, I often find myself going to different panels. And with, of course, COVID silver lining of being on Zoom, I'm able to do that pretty much at a drop of a hat. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I have a life, we all have lives, you know, we're all activists if we're going to be going to these panels, but we have things to do. Some of us, you know, whether we just have a full-time job or we have families or we have classes to get to, whatever it may be, we, we're, we have other things to do besides go to these different meetings in different towns. So something that would just cover it, um, the whole thing, that would, that would really be helpful because other than that, you have native people who are going to these different towns trying to fix a problem that we didn't create. And at least in my personal um, situation, my tribe already spoke out and has an official letter against these mascots. So why, why do I have to, you know, keep saying and repeating what that letter says? On one hand, it is important to have native voices at the forefront of these meetings, but on the other, we already spoke. We just haven't been listened to. So to have some kind of state level law, it would really, really allow people like myself and others on this awesome panel, it would allow us to put our efforts towards something else, maybe put them towards something that would help with representation in those towns, or at least something that we would probably rather do versus putting our efforts into these fights. And um, in my experience, I have seen arguments for and against it. And I think that's a bit silly, you know, 
um, oh, well, it would be greater if the towns did it on themselves. But sometimes the town isn't going to make a move until something greater tells them to. So it really shouldn't be, oh, which way should we go? Again, look at the Native people and how we're being ignored by weighing these options. It would help us if we were able to have a state level ban. Thank you. Rhonda, um, can I just add something quickly? You may. Yeah, I think yeah. just to add, you know, I think it's really important. Uh, it's, it's a great point um, that these individual towns and I, and I understand that their elected officials, you know, ha have sort of a duty to sort of listen to their constituents. But I also feel like um, they have an obligation to do the right thing. And I think Brittany just said it almost every almost every native tribe and organization in the state and, and beyond, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the National Congress of American Indians and their statement, you know, um, but almost every every local tribal entity has gone on record and said, you know, these these mascots are, are inappropriate, they're harming, and it's time for the state um, to get rid of them. And, and I don't think every local community is capable of doing that. And I, and I think it's really paramount that our elected officials do the right thing. And, and sometimes that's not popular, um, but the, you know, especially in, in the times that we're in right now, um, I think it's even more, you know, more paramount that they do that. Now is the perfect time to do that. Uh, I, I don't think we need to wait any longer. And so uh, I know there are many other issues at the state level that are, that are equally important, but I think this is, this is really low hanging fruit for them. Um, and I kind of urge them to, to not wait and delay on this any longer uh, and, and help the local communities uh, in this process. Because I, I think there are a lot of people at the local level that would like to see their communities change, but they do run up against resistance. Uh, and often that resistance uh, is organized and, and throws, even if it's a small amount of people, they'll throw money at, at the sort of propaganda to try to keep those mascots alive. Um, and like Molly and said, they, they do believe that they're, they're the tribe, they are the sachems, they're the sachems, or they're the warriors. Um, and I think it's really important that the state elected officials, you know, step in, uh, make the right call and, and do this quickly and swiftly so that we can sort of move forward with the education and the healing um, that, that's needed. Thank you, Jamie, very important words. Um, Melissa, and um, I, I know that for 35 years now, um, the state house has heard that the state flag and seal bill come through their halls. Um, do you have any um, words uh, to, to talk about the state flag and seal and how that represents you um, and what you would like people to know? You know, I, I think the state flag and seal, uh, I mean, we've all, We've all read um, the reasons why it's offensive. Obviously the sword represents, um, you know, not great things. And I, I just think that we, we have to educate everyone. That's the most important part. Um, we've all witnessed the um, erasure of our existence. And I think it starts with that, the flag and the seal. Um, they're like the, the mascots in the in the towns it has to be statewide i know it's it's great that the towns are accepting the fact and many of them are doing the right thing and changing these mascots but um i think it's a, a a much bigger issue i think as i said it starts with education and it's our our responsibility as tribes to share our voices and to, to educate the, the public on the reasons why. So, I mean, I think, um, yeah, that would, what, that's what I would say about the state seal and the flag. Thank you. Learn. Before I um, close, is there anybody that would like to speak before I close? I wanna make sure that everyone's voices are heard. Laurel. Laurel, go ahead. I just have a general comment about change um, that is aligned with what other people are saying. Um, we do need massive amounts of education 
Um, but as you all know, the percentage of Native people in Massachusetts and in most other parts of the US is relatively small and doesn't have as much access to shaping curriculum in the schools. I mean, individuals can go into schools, but widely shaping the curriculum and widely shaping the media. So for the long term, I think a lot we need to like, you know, make big efforts to try to get systematic changes in curriculum and media. But it's very frustrating, I think, that this is up to non-native people democratically, whether it's the town, um, you know, making a decision, the school board or whomever, or in this case, the state legislature. And it's like non-native control over native representation and over native identity. And that's incredibly frustrating. And the only answer to that, I think, is for people to realize that, that it shouldn't be democratic and they're just gonna to listen to the voices of native nations, pan tribal organizations like the National Congress of American Indians, um, and the Native nations in their area and just do what they say, even if they don't understand it. Um, and like give away their quote unquote control to Native people. And I really think that absolutely has to happen. And it's very, you know, and as we know about the effects of these mascots now, I get more and more angry because the public knows this. And so they, they might not understand the issues, but they do understand the native position. And not listening to that is really offensive. Hey, Laurel. Shauna, did you have something you'd like to add, please? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, before we close, encourage everybody, um, especially those uh, non-natives and natives uh, who are watching right now or later in a replay, um, that while we wait for the bills to hopefully get passed and made into laws here in Massachusetts to still advocate, still um, use your voice, um, don't be afraid to come out and, and talk about how you feel, what your experiences are, because uh, just before this summer, I never spoke on this issue because I was afraid. Um, and, and then it got to a point, I was afraid that I would lose my job in a predominantly white community when I didn't have professional teaching status yet. So um, it was just the time and something told me, just do it, just say it, um, and maybe they'll be accepting of you. And they, they really were. My community absolutely was, and I was shocked, and I'm so proud of them. Um, but even if your community isn't, your voice is still going to be heard by somebody. So while we wait for those bills to get passed into laws, please continue to speak up or use this time now to encourage you to do so. Thank you, Shauna. I know, Anna Juan, you have something you would like to say, but I need to let you know that you're coming in really caught up. So... <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. I might have to like stop you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if this audio is any better. Um, so I just wanted to follow up with uh, what everyone's been saying and uh, again, uh, thank everybody for their time and their uh, concern to be part of today's conversation. Um, I'm not sure if folks can hear audio. Uh, video has been muted. So I just wanted to point out, um, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing some common themes here. Uh, one of which is uh, the fact that we have to defend our, our right to a, our own identity and that this has to go through a democratic process with outside individuals. Um, there are ways that they have intimidated us as Rhonda and others have spoken to. Um, I think it's very shameful that our, our women have found themselves in these situations. Um, however, 
there are intimidation tactics of our own that I think we have yet to employ, one of which is lawsuits. Not sure if anyone's hearing me, but uh, I'm sure that they hear that. Um, when you guys get into their pockets, all of these people I hear that are defending their right to be Eskegan, um, these people who are defending their right to be Natick red men, um, I've heard it myself. I've seen their violence. I've seen their hatred and their ownership of that identity. But I'm curious how many of them are going to be so quick and so eager to own that identity when they're in a class action lost. So I think that if we, uh, again, uh, Brittany made a very valid point, uh, as did Jamie. Uh, we have written documentation already on file from all of our leadership. Uh, we do have congressional documentation as well from an overall uh, all across Turtle Island uh, representation. And then of course, if we do, uh, if we are fortunate to receive uh, legislation in the state and other areas, then it's an issue of, well, we just got to bring, bring it to that severity. Uh, it's a lawsuit. Uh, someone's going to have to pay for this because bottom line, uh, truth and reconciliation, those of you who are familiar with it, the Catholic schools can't just say, oh, we're sorry for what we did. They have to pay for that. They have to invest in that, that the, the reparations, the, the repair that needs to take you know place. You uh, <laughs> uh, Getting Larry and other folks like us to go in and speak, that's great and all. However, uh, funding needs to be made. Uh, the, the, the curriculum that Laurel mentioned uh, on, on, a, on, a, a work, on a national level, not just regional. Um, and then, of course, movies as well. I think if we can uh, find a way to, as he as most people learn things through watching media. So I think that those are avenues that we should explore. So hopefully I haven't spent too much time, hopefully folks can hear me. Thank you, Anawan. Um, I would like to take this moment to direct um, any questions from the audience for our panel. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, a couple of things. There, there are some analogs in other struggles to what you're facing now. The removal of Confederate flag as symbol, the removal of Civil War Southern statues as symbols, and uh, which are beginning to happen, and the removal of some very racist uh, commercial brands, Uncle Ben's, Ben's Jemima. So there is some movement in this area. But it required a never ending battle. There is no time that you can stop saying what you've been saying because elected politicians just don't hear. And to think that I've said it and I don't need to say it again is naive. You're going to need to keep saying it your entire life. And hopefully, some parts of the administration will pick up on it. And as far as I'm concerned, you need as many allies as you can get. One of the things that helps, that has helped in the civil rights movement is uh, a voting block of people, enough people to make a difference in the election of somebody who is in favor of this against somebody who isn't. And if you do not have enough people to create that block, then you need allies in terms of just getting the vote and getting that kind of movement going. Um, so you're not alone. And this is not something that hasn't been faced. 
And I think that it's important to look to other people who are having similar situations, to talk to them and get them to ally with you. And um, it's a power, it, it, it creates more power when the power structure is hearing from more people and more diverse than them. So that's Thank you. Thank you for that comment. I think it's important to understand um, that Native Americans did not have the right to vote. It was not secured until 1966. A National Congress of American Indians um, have been fighting mascots since 1968. So we're continuing that fight here today. And um, Native American spirituality was illegal until 1978. These, uh, most of these are within my timeline and we're still fighting and we're not giving up. And our younger generation is also here today. Um, Stacy? Hi, can I say something? Yes. Um, I would, I'd like to say that I think it's important for us um, to not say what you should do. Um, so I'd just like to take issue with that. Um, and also it's important to acknowledge what one of you said about you're tired of having to represent yourselves in this, which is why I said that you two, the co-directors of Okite, are generously willing to educate us um, and share in the education of us because actually Okiteo and this, um, I think I'm in the way, this, um, the concept of Okiteo is for you, not for you to have to teach us or be told what we should do about um, racist attitudes towards you. Um, and I'm gonna take an opportunity to thank some people um, because the National Endowment for the Arts is supporting um, our activities on educating our community um, on with our with native programs and also with black artist programs. Um, and so this is an our town award that was given for um, people to have access to black and indigenous lives and arts um, in our community. We'd also like to thank HowlRound, who is now um, sponsoring or putting this live stream up and in, in their archives of this entire series. Um, and also, I do think there are some legislatures who are standing up and they're sitting down in the room right now. And I'd like to thank you for um, for being with us and also for your support. I think that um, the whole legislature should be supporting these laws. Um, and I used to pride myself that Massachusetts was first in many different freedoms in this country and we're sorely lagging behind in regard to um, natives, the seal, the flag, and mascot laws, um, but the people who are in this room, Senator Adam Hines, um, Senator Joe Comerford, and Representative Natalie Blay are ones that are helping lead this charge in the legislature, and we hope you win soon. Thank you. Um, did I, I saw one hand up in the way back. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, is that, is that Zoe? What are resources that we should be looking at? Does anyone have any um, information that we can share? I know that we, we can go, you can go to maindigenousagenda.org. Um, there's a lot of information there on that website um, about the bills that are currently up. Um, and how they can be supported. And again, I wanna reiterate Mass Peace Action is having this coming Wednesday, 
um, from 10 to 12.30, um, uh, an online lobby day. I encourage you wholeheartedly to go to both of those websites and participate. Okay. All right, so um, I want to thank our panelists one more time for taking time out of their busy day. <laughs> And thank you to our supporters. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we could not be doing this important work without the support of our allies and accomplices, and that's you. Um, so, and, and Okateo means to grow. And because of your generous support, we are truly growing. So, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Talra. You have anything? <laughs> um, Rhonda pretty much said it all. I want to certainly uh, thank all the panels for coming out uh, virtually, as it were, <laughs> to Okiteo. And uh, you all are like just fabulous um, leaders and activists. Um, and so we hope to have you all out here in person doing uh, multiple events and you know showcasing your work, uh, 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 doing solos and so on, whatever you would like. Um, that's what Okiteo is about. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, just really just heartwarming to, to be a part of this myself. And uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, good to bottom -ish. Thank you. Anybody would like to say hello to any of the people who are live here? Um, please.